Hey everyone, this is Neha from Edureka and I welcome you all to Edureka's YouTube channel. This session is all about software testing interview questions. This is going to help you if you are looking for any job profile in software testing domain. So let's look at the topics to be covered in this session. First, I will talk about the market trends in software testing. Next, I will tell you what is software testing and its types. And moving further, I will be discussing top 50 interview questions that will be helpful for freshers and experienced professional as well. Without any further ado, let's get straight into the module. First, let's see what are the latest trends in software testing. With the advent of agile and DevOps development technologies, the software development industry is undergoing major disruptions and this has led to the evolution of new testing approaches. The quality assurance professionals have to rapidly adapt to the changes in the software testing industry to stay relevant. So this is a list of top 10 software testing trends for 2019 and they are digital transformation with agile, machine learning in testing, increasing adoption of DevOps, big data testing, IoT testing, performance engineering, test automation, combining manual and automated testing, shortening delivery cycle and integration. And as you can see here, from 2005 to 2019, there is a drastic growth in software testing market trends. So before it was somewhere between 20 and $30,000 and now you can see it is between 30 to $40,000. And that means there is a rapid growth of software testing domain in the IT market. And talking about the salary trends, the average salary for a quality assurance analyst ranges from approximately $53,500 per year and the people who are working as an entry-level QA have an average annual salary of $44,200 per year. So you might feel it's quite a good opportunity to get into software testing domain, right? Having understood the market trends, let's go ahead and see what software testing actually is. Software testing can be defined as the action for checking if the tangible result or output of a product matches with the projected or expected output. And testing of a software also involves the implementation of products module or systems par for evaluating all or some of its properties. Through testing, testers can identify errors, gaps in requirement or missing elements in a project or system. And testing can be done both manually or with the help of automated tools that are available in the market. Software testing also plays a significant role in software or system bugs that can be expensive and can lead to a dangerous situation. Basically, there are two types of testing. One is manual testing and the other one is automation testing. So manual testing is a testing of a software without the use of automated tool or applications that are available in the market. Automation testing is an automated technique where the tester writes a script by his own and uses a suitable tool to test the software. It is basically an automation process of a manual process. So these are the two important types of software testing. So these are some of the companies that are using software testing like we have Capgemini, Infosys, Cognizant, HP, Wipro, Hexaware and Signsoft. So if you wish to build your career in software testing domain, then you can kickstart your career with these companies. Having understood these fundamentals, let's dive into the interview question and answers that will be helpful for you to crack software testing interview. I have divided the interview questions in three sections. That is beginner level, intermediate level and an advanced level. Advanced level is basically for experienced professional. Beginner level is for freshers and intermediate level is for experience for one to two years. First, Let's see beginner level or fresher level questions. Now let's begin and see what is the first question that we have on the list. So the question here is what are the phases involved in software testing life cycle? First, let me tell you what a software testing life cycle. Software testing life cycle defines a series of activities conducted to perform software testing. In this, each activity is carried out in a planned and systematic way and each phase has different goals and deliverable. That is, it identifies what test activities to carry out and when to accomplish those test activities. So these are the phases involved in software testing lifecycle. That is requirement analysis, test planning, test case development, environment setup, test execution and test cycle closure. 
So what is requirement analysis? This is the very first step in software testing life cycle and in this step quality assurance team understands the requirement in terms of what we will be testing and figure out the testable requirements. Next test planning. Test planning is the most important phase where all the test strategy is defined. This phase is also called as test strategy phase. In this phase, test manager is involved to determine the effort and cost estimates for entire project. It also defines the objective and scope of the project. Now coming to test case development. In this phase, testing team will write down the detailed test cases. Along with the test cases, testing team also prepare the test data if any required for testing. Once the test cases are ready, then these test cases are reviewed by peer members or QA lead and setting up the environment is vital part of STLC because test environment decides on which condition software is being tested and this is the independent activity and can be started in parallel with test case development. Next test execution. This is a process of executing the code and comparing the expected and actual results. Now talking about the last phase test cycle closure. This is a document that gives a summary of the tests conducted during the software development life cycle. It also gives a detailed analysis of the bugs removed and errors found. In other words, test closure is a memo that is prepared prior to formally completing the testing process. So this is all about the phases involved in software testing life cycle. You can just list down the phases and can give a short explanation to each of these phases. Let's see what's next question. What is the difference between black box white box and gray box testing or it can also be asked like this. What are the different methods of testing? First black box black box testing is a testing strategy based on requirements and specifications black box testing requires no knowledge of internal parts structures or implementations of the software being tested coming to white box. This is a testing strategy based on internal parts, core structures and implementation of the software being tested. White box testing generally requires detailed programming skills. Last one gray box. Gray box is a strategy for software debugging in which the tester has limited knowledge of the internal details of the program. A gray box is a device program or system whose workings are partially understood that is the internal implementation details are partly known to the tester. So these are the methods and the differences between black box white box and gray box testing. Next what are the different levels of testing? So the different levels of testing are unit testing integration testing system testing and acceptance testing. So what is unit testing in this testing level individual sections or parts of a software or product is being tested. The idea of this is to confirm every parts or unit of the product after the test. Next integration testing in the software testing level individual parts need to combine as well as a test as a single cluster. The main idea of this testing level is for exposing the faults while interacting between integrated units of the project. Next system testing here the whole integrated software or project is tested. The principle of this testing is to assess the system's conformity with its intended requirements. Coming to acceptance testing, this is a last level and here a system needs to be tested for adequacy. This testing is purposefully done for evaluating the compliance of a system with business requirements. So these are the different levels of testing that starts with unit testing and ends with acceptance testing. Next. Explain defect or bug life cycle. First, I will tell you what is defect life cycle. It is a cycle which a defect goes through during its lifetime. It starts when a defect is found and ends when a defect is closed after ensuring it is not reproduced. Defect life cycle is related to the bug found during testing. So these are the various phases involved in defect life cycle where it starts with new and ends with closed. So what is a new state when a defect is logged and posted for the first time its state is given as new. Next assign after the tester has posted the bug 
The lead of the tester approves that the bug is genuine and he assigns the bug to corresponding developer and the developer team. And that time its state is given as assigned. Next active or open. At this state the developer has started analyzing and working on the defect fix. Next you have test where the defect will be tested. After the defect is being tested it goes to verified state that is the tester tests the bug again after it got fixed by the developer. If the bug is not present in the software, he approves that the bug is fixed and changes the state to verify. But if the bug still exists even after the bug is fixed by the developer, the tester changes the status to reopen. When it goes to reopen, the bug goes through the life cycle once again. Next, closed. If the tester feels that the bug no longer exists in the software, he changes the state of the bug to closed. This state means that the bug is fixed, tested and approved. So there are two more stages that is rejected and deferred. Rejected state implies if the developer feels that bug is not genuine, he rejects the bug. Then the state of the bug is changed to rejected. And there is one more state called deferred. Here the bug change to deferred state means the bug is expected to be fixed in the next releases. The reasons for changing the bug to this state have many factors. Some of them are priority of the bug may be low, lack of time for the release or the bug may not have effect on the software. So this is all about the various stages involved in a bug life cycle and a bug goes through all these phases once it is new. Now let's move further and see what's the next question. What is a test case? Test case engage in collected steps and conditions with inputs which can be implemented at the time of testing. This activity focuses on making sure whether a product went through a set of tests or fails by any means such as functionality or other aspects. Many types of test cases are being checked during testing and they are functional test cases, logical and physical test cases, negative error test cases and user interface test cases as well. When asked what is a test case, you have to just give a simple explanation like I told you. Next, what is the difference between functional and non-functional testing? Functional testing is a type of a testing which verifies that each function of the software application operates in conformance with the requirement specification. This testing mainly involves black box testing and it is not concerned about the source code of the application. Every functionality of the system is testing by providing appropriate input, verifying the output and comparing the actual results with expected results. And this testing also involves checking of user interface, APIs, database, security, client server application and functionality of the application under test. The testing can be done either manually or using automation tool. So what is non-functional testing? Non-functional testing deals to check non-functional aspects like performance, usability, reliability of a software application. It is explicitly designed to test the readiness of a system as per non-functional parameters which are never addressed by functional testing. A good example of non-functional testing would be to check how many people can simultaneously log in into a software. And it is equally important as functional testing and affects client satisfaction. And as you can see, functional testing is performed always before non-functional testing. And functional testing is based on customer requirements while non-functional testing is based on customer expectations. And functional testing describes what the product does and on the other hand, non-functional describes how the product works. What is verification and validation in software testing? Verification is a static analysis technique. In this technique, testing is done without executing the code. So the examples are reviews, inspection and walkthrough. So validation is a dynamic analysis technique where testing is done by executing the code. And examples are functional and non-functional testing techniques. So one more important point to note here in verification and validation model, the development and QA activities are done simultaneously. There is no discrete phase called testing. Rather testing starts right from the requirement phase. The verification and validation activities go hand in hand. 
Next question on the list is what is usability testing? Usability testing is a testing methodology where the end customer is asked to use the software to see if the product is ready to use to see the customer perception and task time. The best way to finalize the customer point of view for usability is by using prototype or mock-up software during the initial stages. By giving the customer the prototype before the development startup, we confirm that we are not missing anything from user point of view. That's basically usability testing. Next question on the list is what are the categories of defect? Defect has three main categories and they are wrong, missing and extra. So what is a wrong category? Wrong category implies the requirements have been implemented incorrectly. This defect is a variance from the given specification. Next missing. It implies the requirement given by the customer was not done. This is a variance from the specification an indication that a specification was not implemented or a requirement of the customer was not noted properly. Next extra a requirement incorporated into the product that was given by the end customer. This is always a variance from the specification but may be an attribute desired by the user of the product. However, it is considered a defect because it's a variance from the existing requirements. These are the three different ways in which a defect is being categorized. Tenth question is on what basis acceptance plan is prepared in any project. The acceptance document is normally prepared using the inputs that are being mentioned in the figure and this can vary from company to company and from project to project. So the basis are requirement document. It specifies what exactly is needed in the project from the customer's perspective and customer input. This can be discussion, informal talks, emails, etc. Project plan. This is prepared by the project manager and also serves as a good input to finalize your acceptance test and a user manual. So next question is what is coverage and what are the different types of coverage techniques? Coverage is a measurement used in software testing to describe the degree to which the source code is being tested. There are three different types of techniques that is statement coverage, decision coverage and path coverage. So in statement coverage, it ensures that each line of the source code has been executed and tested and decision coverage ensures every decision in the source code has been executed and tested. And path coverage ensures that every possible route through a given part of code is executed and tested. So this is all about coverage and different types of coverage techniques. Next we'll move on to some concepts of automation testing and understand some important questions. So the question here is what are the benefits of automation testing? Benefits are supports execution of repeated tasks enables parallel execution improves accuracy aids in testing large test metrics encourages unattended execution and saves time and money and improves accuracy thereby reducing human generated errors. So next question is why selenium is a preferred tool for automation testing. Selenium is an open source tool which is used for automating the test carried out on web browsers. Before you get carried away let me reiterate that. Only testing of web applications is possible with Selenium. We can neither test any desktop application nor test any mobile application using Selenium. Since Selenium is open source, there is no licensing cost involved, which is a major advantage over other testing tools. Other reasons behind Selenium ever growing popularity are test scripts can be written in any of the programming languages like Java. Python, Ruby, C Sharp, .NET, etc. And tests can be carried out in any of these OS like Windows, Mac or Linux. And tests can be carried out using any browser like Mozilla, Internet Explorer, Google Chrome, Safari, Opera, etc. And it can be integrated with tools such as TestNG and JUnit for managing test cases and generating reports. Also, it can be integrated with Jenkins, Docker, Maven to achieve continuous testing. 
So that's the reason Selenium is a preferred tool and widely used tool for automation testing in the IT market. Next, what are different Selenium components? As you all know, Selenium is the most popular tool for automation testing suits. It is designed in a way to support and encourage automation testing of functional aspects of web applications and a wide range of browsers and platforms. Due to its existence in the open source community, it has become one of the most accepted tool amongst the testing professionals. Selenium is not just a single tool or a utility, rather a package of several testing tools and for the same reason it is referred to as a suit. Each of these tools is designed to cater different testing and test environment requirements. So the tools used are Selenium ID, Selenium RC that is the remote control, Selenium web driver and Selenium grid. So Selenium IDE is a record and playback tool. It is distributed as a Firefox plugin. Selenium RC is a server that allows a user to create test scripts in the desired programming language. It also allows executing test scripts within the large spectrum of browsers. And coming to WebDriver, it is a different tool altogether that has various advantages over Selenium RC. And WebDriver directly communicates with the web browser and it uses native compatibility to automate. And Selenium Grid is used to distribute your test execution on multiple platforms and environments concurrently. So these are the different components of Selenium. Let's see what's the next question. The question here is, what are different types of locators in Selenium? Locator can be termed as an address that identifies a web element uniquely within the web page. Thus, to identify web elements accurately and precisely, we have different types of locators in Selenium, and they are ID, name, link text, CSS selector, partial link text, XPath. So these are the important one, and there are tag name and DOM locators as well. Next, what is XPath? XPath, also called as XML path, is a language to query XML documents. It is an important strategy to locate elements in Selenium. It consists of a path expression along with some conditions. You can easily write XPath script or query to locate any element in the web page. It is designed to allow the navigation of XML documents with the purpose of selecting individual elements, attributes, or some or other part of an XML document for specific processing. It also produces reliable locators. So next question is, what is the difference between absolute and relative XPath? Absolute XPath is a direct way to find the element. But the disadvantage of absolute XPath is that if there are any changes made in the path of the element, then that path gets failed. Say in Google.com, I want to inspect the search box. So here it has an ID locator whose value is Q. If I want to locate the search box using absolute XPath, I have to start writing my X path from HTML. So it will be HTML of one followed by body of one because the immediate child and then it has to go through this div, then through this div and form and div and again input. And to overcome the complexity of absolute X path, there is one more type of X path called as relative X path. In this, the path starts from the middle of the HTML DOM structure. It begins with a double forward slash, which means it can search the element anywhere at the web page. So just simply give double forward slash, and I want to locate this search box. So as you can see, it starts with the input. So I'll write my input tag, and it has the attribute whose value is Q. So what I'll do, I'll write open and close. I'll write square braces and at. It has a locator value, it's ID, and within single quotes, I'll write it as Q. So this is how you need to write a relative X path. So this is the difference between absolute and relative X path. So next question that we have on the list is, what are the different exceptions in Selenium WebDriver? Exceptions in Selenium are similar to exceptions in other programming languages. The most commonly used exceptions are, Timeout exception. So this exception is thrown when a command performing an operation does not complete in the stipulated time. Next, no such element exception. 
This is thrown when an element with given attribute is not found on the web page. Next, element not visible. This is thrown when the element is present in DOM but not visible on the web page. That is, it is present in document object model but not on the web page. Next, state element exception. This is thrown when the element is either deleted or no longer attached to the DOM. So these are the most commonly used exceptions in Selenium WebDriver. Next question that we have is what is Selenium Grid and when should we use it? So as I have already mentioned, it can be used to execute same or different test scripts on multiple platforms and browser concurrently to achieve distributed test execution, testing under different environments and saving execution time remarkably. As I have already told, Selenium Grid is one of the Selenium components and can be used to execute same or different test scripts on multiple platforms and browsers concurrently to achieve distributed test execution, testing under different environments and saving execution time remarkably. So next question is how to launch browser using WebDriver. So you can simply use a WebDriver command and create an object of a particular driver. So if you are using Firefox browser, you have to create a Firefox driver. And similarly, if you are using Chrome driver, you have to create an object of a new Chrome driver. And for Chrome driver, we have a Chrome driver, but for Firefox, we are using Geeko driver. So this brings us to the end of the questions for freshers or beginners. Now let's see some intermediate level questions. The first question on intermediate level is, should testing be done only after the build and execution phases are complete? In traditional testing methodology, Testing is always done after the build and execution phases, but that's a wrong way of thinking because the earlier we can catch the defect, the more cost effective it is. For instance, fixing a defect in maintenance is 10 times more costly than fixing it during execution. In the requirement phase, we can verify if the requirements are met according to the customer needs. During design, we can check whether the design document covers all the requirements. In this stage, we can also generate rough functional data. We can also review the design document from the architecture and correctness perspectives. In the build and execution phase, we can execute unit test cases and generate structural and functional data. And finally comes the testing phase done in traditional way, that is, run the system test cases and see if the system works according to the requirements. During installation, we need to see if the system is compatible with the software. And finally, during the maintenance phase, when any fixes are made, we can retest the fixes and follow the regression testing. Therefore, testing should occur in conjunction with each phase of software development. And that's why we have the verification and validation model where development and testing activities are carried out in parallel. Next question that we have is, what is the relationship between environmental reality and test phases? Environment reality becomes more important as test phases start moving ahead. For instance, during unit testing, you need the environment to be partly real. But at the acceptance phase, you should have a 100% real environment or we can say it should be the actual real environment. The graph shows how with every phase the environment reality should also increase and finally during acceptance it should be 100% real. So for integration it should be 20% for system 30% for acceptance 40 and at the end it should be 100% real. So that's the relationship between environment reality and test phase. Next question that we have is a defect which could have been removed during the initial stage is removed in a later stage. So how does this affect the cost? So the answer is if a defect is known at the initial stage, then it should be removed during that stage itself. It's a recorded fact that if a defect is delayed for a later phases, it proves more costly. So as you can see in the figure, how a defect is costly as the phases move forward. A defect if identified and removed during the requirement and design phase is more cost effective while a defect removed during the maintenance is 20 times costlier during the requirement and design phases. For instance, if a defect is identified during requirement and design, 
we only need to change the documentation but if identified during the maintenance phase we not only need to fix the defect but also change our test plans do regression testing and change all documentation this is why defect should be identified or removed in earlier phases and the testing department should be involved right from the requirement phase and not after the execution so that's a reason why development and testing activity should go hand in hand next what do you mean by regression and confirmation testing regression testing is used for regression defects regression defects are the defects that occur when the functionality which was once working normally has stopped working this is probably because of the changes made in the program or the environment to uncover such kind of defect regression testing is conducted so if we fix a defect in an existing application we use confirmation testing to test if the defect is removed it's very possible because of this defect or changes to the application that other sections of the application are affected so to ensure that no other section is affected we can use regression testing to confirm this so regression testing ensures that the defect is not introduced and confirmation testing ensures that defect is fixed next explain boundary value analysis in software testing the boundary value analysis is a black box test design technique based on test cases this technique is applied to see if there are any bugs at the boundary of the input domain thus with this method there is no need of looking for these errors at the center of this input and boundary value analysis helps in testing the value of boundary between both valid and invalid boundary partitions with this technique the boundary values are tested by the creation of test cases for a particular input field so the extreme ends or boundary partitions might depict the values of lower upper start and maximum minimum inside outside etc in general the boundary value analysis technique comes under the stress and negative testing this technique is an easy quick and brilliant way to catch any input errors that might occur to interrupt the functionality of a program so to save their time and cut the testing procedure short the experts delivering software testing and quality management services rely on the boundary value analysis method for testing of data related to boundaries and ranges this method is considered as a very suitable one you can mark out the maximum and minimum ranges and find out the boundary values so this is all about boundary value analysis so next question is what is random or monkey testing random testing is sometimes called as monkey testing in this data is generated randomly often using a tool for instance in this figure you can see how randomly generated data is sent into a system the data is generated either using a tool or some automated mechanism with this randomly generated input the system is then tested and results are observed accordingly but the weakness of random testing is that they are not realistic many of the tests are redundant and unrealistic you will spend more time analyzing results and you cannot recreate the test if you do not record what data was used for testing so the next question is if you are being asked on what basis you can arrive to an estimation for your project you should explain the following pointers that is divide the whole project into smallest tasks and then allocate each task to team members after that you have to estimate the effort required to complete each task and validate the estimation so these are the key pointers on the basis that you can arrive to an estimation for your project so next question is which test cases are written first white box test cases or black box test cases so normally black box test cases are written first and white box test cases are written later in order to write white box test cases we need the requirement document design and project plan all these documents are easily available at the initial start of the project in order to write black box test cases we need the requirement document design and project plan and all these documents are easily available at the initial start of the project 
White box test cases cannot be started in the initial phase of the project because there need more architecture clarity which is not available at the start of the project. So normally white box test cases are written after black box test cases are written. And also black box test cases do not require system understanding but white box test cases needs more structural understanding and structural understanding is clear in the later part of the project that is while executing or designing and for black box testing you need to only analyze from the functional perspective which is easily available from a simple requirement document. So next that we have on the list is mention what are the basic components of defect report format. The basic components are project name module name defect detected on and defect detected by ID and name of a defect the snapshot and the severity and priority status and the defect resolved by. These are the components that must be present in every defect report. And this is a format that should be maintained. Next question is Is automation testing in agile methodology useful or not? Automation testing is useful for regression, smoke, or sanity testing. All these types of testing in traditional waterfall model happen at the end of the cycle and sometimes if there are not many enhancements to the application we might not even have to do regression testing. Whereas in agile methodology every iteration requires executing the regression test case as a new functionality is added. Also the regression suit itself keeps growing after each sprint as a functional test case of the current sprint module need to be added to the regression suit for the next sprint. Thus automation testing in agile methodology is very useful and helps in achieving maximum test coverage in a less time of the sprint. So automation testing is very helpful in agile methodology. Next which test cases can be automated. So the answer is smoke test cases, regression, complex calculation, data driven and non-functional test cases can be automated. The next question that we have is on what basis you can map the success of automation testing. The answer goes like this. The success of automation testing can be mapped by defect detection ratio, automation execution time and time savings to release the product, reduction in labor and other costs. So these are the criteria on which you can map the success of automation testing. So how will you answer if an interviewer asks you explain load testing on websites. So you can answer like this to access a website a user sends a request to the website server and the server sends back a response in the form of the website that you want to access to load test a website. Quality assurance engineers and automation engineers just need to multiply the number of responses sent to simulate different traffic loads and the web server's response to the influx of virtual users can be measured. This is used to determine performance issues and server capacity. So this is how you can carry out load testing on websites. Next question is what is the difference between Selenium and SQLi? So the differences are Selenium cannot automate flash objects like video player, audio player, etc. SQLi provides extensive support to automate flash objects. Selenium has got complicated API and SQLi has simple API. Selenium does not have visual match whereas SQLi uses a visual match to find elements on the screen so that we can automate anything we see on the screen. And Selenium can automate only web applications and SQLi can automate the web applications as well as Windows applications as well. Next question is how to click on a hyperlink using link text. So there are two types of link text that is link text and partial link text. So using link text as you can see on the screen you have to use driver dot find element by as a class name and link text is a locator and if you have a link text called Google you have to give the value of the attribute and then use click method. 
as it is a link you cannot use send keys you have to use the click method because we are clicking on the hyperlink and for partial link text if there is any partial link being present you can use it like this the command finds the element using link text and click on that element and thus the user would be redirected to the corresponding page and using partial link text this also finds the element based on the substring of the link provided in the parenthesis and thus partial link text finds the web element with a specified substring and then clicks on it next question is what is test ng test ng is an open source framework which is distributed under apache software license and is readily available for download as well and test ng with web driver provides an efficient and effective test result format that can in turn be shared with the stakeholders to have a glimpse on the product's applications health thereby eliminating the drawback of web drivers in capability to generate test reports and test ng has an inbuilt exception handling mechanism which lets the program to run without terminating unexpectedly so the advantages are it has added advanced and easy annotations it also has execution patterns and it has concurrent execution of test scripts next how to set test case priority in test ng so here is the code for you to test the priority of a test case very simple you have to use add test annotation and go on setting the priorities like 0 1 and 2 for your methods so the output will be first method 1 will be executed then method 2 will be executed and then method 3 will be executed so if you change the priorities then the method that has a priority of 0 will be executed first so this is how you can set the priority next what is the difference between selenium and qtp that is quick test professional so selenium supports almost all the popular web browsers like firefox chrome safari internet explorer opera etc and qtp supports internet explorer firefox and chrome qtp only supports windows operating system and selenium is distributed as an open source tool and is freely available whereas qtp is distributed as a licensed tool and is commercialized selenium supports testing of only web based applications on the other hand QTP supports testing of both the web application and windows based application and selenium also supports multiple programming languages like java ruby python etc and QTP supports only visual basic script so this is the difference between QTP and selenium let's see what's the next question what is object repository how can we create object repository in selenium object repository is a term used to refer to the collection of web elements belonging to application under test along with their locator values thus whenever the element is required within the script the locator value can be populated from the object repository object repository is used to store locators in centralized location instead of hard coding them with the scripts in selenium objects can be stored in an excel sheet which can be populated inside the script whenever required so this is about object repository next so how to input text in the text box using selenium web driver by using send keys method we can input the text in the text box using selenium web driver i'll show you how so i have created a small program and i have created my chrome driver because i'm using chrome browser and then i'm setting the property using system.set property i'm deleting all the cookies and using a page slow timeout and implicitly wait and using driver.get i'm navigating through login page of yahoo and using xpath i have written xpath for login username and sent edureka@yahoo.com in the email box that will be your text box using send keys method and i'm waiting for 10 seconds using thread.sleep and again using a click method to click on the next button and this is again the x path for the same now save the program run it and check the output so what will happen now chrome driver will launch google chrome navigate to yahoo.com 
entered eduraka at the rate yahoo.com in the text field. It will wait for 10 seconds and then clicked on next. So this is how using send keys you can send the values to a particular page and using click you can click on the next button or you can click on any of the hyperlinks. So this is how you can use send keys method. Next we'll move on to the advanced level questions. So the first question will be what kind of input do we need from the end user to begin proper testing? The product has to be used by the user. He or she is the most important person as he or she has more interest than anyone else in the project. From the user we need acceptance test plan because it defines the entire test which the product has to pass so that it can go into production. And we also need the requirement document from the customer and the customer should also define the risky sections of the project. For instance in a normal accounting project if a voucher entry section does not work then it will stop the accounting functionality completely. But if the reports are not derived, the accounting department can use it for some time. So the customer is the right person to say which section will affect him the most. With this feedback, the testers can prepare a proper test plan for those areas and test it accordingly. And the customer should also provide some proper data for testing. Feeding proper data during testing is very important. So this is the input we need from the end user to begin proper testing. So the next question is can you explain workbench concept? In order to understand testing methodology we need to understand the workbench concept. A workbench is a way of documenting how a specific activity has to be performed. A workbench is referred to as phases, steps and tasks. So there are five tasks for every workbench that is input. Every task needs some input defined and the entrance criteria. For every workbench, we need defined inputs. Input forms the first steps of the workbench. So next, execute. This is the main task of the workbench which will transform the input into the expected output. Next, we have check. Check steps assure that the output after execution meets the desired result. Next, production output. If the check is right, the production output forms the exit criteria of the workbench. And the last phase is rework. During the check step, if the output is not as desired, then we need to again start from the execute step. So these are the phases involved in the workbench concept. The next question is, what is meant by defect cascading? Defect cascading is a defect which is caused by another defect. One defect triggers the other defect. For instance, in the accounting application, there is a defect which leads to negative taxation. So, the negative taxation defect affects the ledger which in turn affects the other four modules. That is your balance sheet, your balance, profit and loss or profit earning. So, that is all about defect cascading. Next question is, what are the different strategies for rollout to end users? There are four major ways for rolling out any project and it starts from pilot. That is the actual production system is installed at a single or limited number of users. Pilot basically means that the product is actually rolled out to limited users for real work. Next gradual implementation. In this we ship the entire product to limited user or all user at the customer end. Here the developers get instant feedback from the recipients which allow them to make changes before the product is available. But the downside is that developers and testers maintain more than one version at one time. Next phased implementation. In this implementation the product is rolled out to all users in incrementally. That means each successive rollout has some added functionality. So as new functionality comes in and the customer tests them progressively. The benefit of this kind of rollout is that the customers can start using the functionality and provide valuable feedback progressively. The only issue here is that with each rollout and added functionality the integration becomes more complicated. And the last one is parallel implementation. In these types of rollouts, the existing application is run side by side with the new application. If there are any issues encountered with the new application, we again move back to the old application. One of the biggest problems with parallel implementation is that 
we need extra hardware software and resources next question is explain how can you find broken links in a page using selenium web driver this is a tricky question which the interview will present to you he can provide a situation wherein there are 20 links in the web page and you have to verify which of those 20 links are working and how many of them are not working since you need to verify the working of every link the workaround is that you need to send the http request to all the links on the web page and analyze the response whenever you use driver.get method to navigate to a url it will respond with the status of 200 ok 200 ok denotes that the link is working and it has been obtained if any other status is obtained then it is an indication that the link is broken but how will you do that first we have to use the anchor tags to determine different hyperlinks on the web page for each anchor tag we can use attribute href value to obtain the hyperlinks and then analyze the response received for the each hyperlink when used in driver.get method so this is how you can find broken links in a web page next question is which technique should you consider using throughout the script if there is neither frame id nor frame name if frame id nor frame name is available then we can use frame by index let's say there are three frames in a web page and if none of them have the frame name and frame id then we can still select those frames by using frame index attribute each frame will have an index number the first phase would be at index 0 the next at index 1 and the third at index 2 once the frame has been selected all subsequent calls on the web driver interface will be made to that frame that is you can use driver.switch to dot frame and you can pass some end argument so this is how you can use frame by index if frame id and frame name are not available the next question on the list is how to take screenshots in selenium web driver you can take screenshots by using the take screenshot function and by using get screenshot as method you can save that screenshot so you can see here so say you have a source file and you are using a take screenshot for that particular driver and using get screenshot as you are saving that screenshot so this is a very simple function used to capture the screenshot and save it so the next question is explain how will you log into any site if it is showing any authentication pop-up for username and password since there will be pop-up for logging in we need to use the explicit command and verify if the alert is actually present only if the alert is present we need to pass the username and password credentials the sample code is as shown here so you are using web driver wait that is your explicit way and waiting for 10 seconds so you are using expected conditions that alert is present and authenticate it using for username and password so this is a command that you have to use it for authentication pop-up next question is how to skip a method or a code block in test ng if you want to skip a particular test method then you can set the enabled parameter in the annotation to false that is your test annotation that is at test and enable it to false so by doing that you can skip a method or a code block in test ng so the last question that we have is briefly explain what the following snippet of java code does that is web element sample is equal to driver dot find element by x path and it contains a text whose value is data so what it does is it defines a variable sample of type web element and uses an x path search to initialize it with a reference to an element that contains the text value data contains and text both are x path functions and it is trying to search an element which contains a text value of data with this we come to an end of advanced questions and this brings us to the end of software testing interview questions i tried my best to cover interview questions for freshers and experienced professionals as well i hope you gain some knowledge out of it so that was all about software testing interview questions thank you and have a nice day i hope you have enjoyed listening to this video Please be kind enough to like it and you can comment any of your doubts and queries and we will reply them at the earliest. Do look out for more videos in our playlist.
and subscribe to Edureka channel to learn more. Happy learning!